Scotland at uh, Graham's Bell uh, Garden. And it's really exciting to see. It's the uh, beginning of the spring and it's pretty open. So Graham's going to tell us now what's the story of this place. Okay, we, uh, we moved here in 1988 and we came to this place in 1990. And we were living for a couple of years and then we bought this, uh, it was a bungalow at the time. And um, well, I have some rules of thumb. And one is that kitchen gardens are successful in inverse proportion to their distance from the back door. So here is the kitchen door. So you start here. Uh, and um, when we started here, we have less than a quarter acre of a garden, um, quite a lot less than a quarter of an hectare. <laughs> 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 um, it's a bit hard to see it now, but there was really nothing here. Um, this was flat garden. If you go on our website, you can see a picture of it, how it was um, 25 years ago. Mm, nothing, really. So, um, we dug out a little bit here to make a space for our kitchen table. And then we made a chicken tractor here, mm -hmm. which was about um, two meters by three meters, no, two meters by two meters, meter high. And it had uh, a whole bunch of chickens in. And we put it there and they ate off all the waste and mucked the ground and ate off all the bugs and we moved it there and then we dug the ground over and then we moved it there and then we dug the ground over and then we moved it there and then we randomly started to create these raised beds um, which you can still see um, the secret is that uh, bed that's semi-circular in cross-section like these is uh, has one and a half times the ground area of a flat ground. You can reach the middle of it uh, so you can harvest things from it and you never need to walk on it. So once you've created it that's how you go. And then you mulch it and then the birds come in and they break the mulch down and then you keep putting the mulch from the pathways in the middle back on top of the bed so that's where we started uh, so this garden is as I said less than a quarter of an acre and last year it produced one metric ton of food plus um, 5,000 plants that we sell in the nursery so it's quite productive and <coughs> We grow here top fruit, so we have um, apples, there's a very young apple tree here. Um, you'll see bigger apple trees as we go around. Soft fruit, um, so here are some currants and so on. Um, gooseberries over there. Um, herbs, we have some herbs down here. Um, salads. Lots of perennial flowers, and then in between we have spaces where we grow annual vegetables and so on. Um, How many years is this under development? This is uh, 24 years now. The permaculture now. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> here are plants to sell. Occasionally we get volunteers and somebody made a herb spiral here. Okay. Um, yeah, herb spiral is one of Bill Mollison's ways of explaining some principles. If you have a big garden like this, you don't need a herb spiral. Mm -hmm. um, but it's in a small garden, it creates lots of edge and space and so on here. But anyway, good to have herbs near the back door so when you're cooking you can just come out and cut some fresh herbs to cook with. Well, here's an interesting thing. Now, here we are. This is March. 
in Scotland and you can see these are now shooting. These are gooseberries. Um, we started with grafted gooseberries, grafted on Jostaberry because you get this upright plant and we discovered that actually it's much easier to grow them as the Victorians did by simply pruning the plant to an upright stem like this. Okay. And so gooseberries, as you might notice, have got these sharp spines on them. Ooh. So these are very difficult to pick. But if you grow them like this, they're easier. You don't have to bend down. It's easier to see where the spines are. And you don't get mildew, which is a common problem with gooseberries, because the air gets through them. Mm -hmm. This plant will produce four kilos of fruit this year. Wow. And wow. by July, we have a freezer full, and that feeds us with soft fruit for all we need in a year. Um, in between, we have various other things. Um, these are <coughs> lungwort, Pulmonaria officinalis. It's uh, the doctrine of signatures. Um, the early botanists learned that um, if you looked at plants, they would tell you what their herbal uses were. This, so this is supposed to look like a diseased lung. So pulmonaria is supposed to be very good for your um, breathing if you needed uh, herbal remedies. Um, who knows? It does transpire that they are good for that. Um, hellebores here. Um, just flowers in the garden. Attract insects. Att insects attract birds. And you can hear if you listen. All the birds sing. This garden is alive with birds and insects. And what that does is it creates a self-managing system where you don't need chemicals because everything looks after everything else. So in this garden, everything's healthy and alive. Um, I worry if we don't have aphids. If we don't have aphids, you've got nothing for the blue, bird, blue tits to eat. It's all, it's all about creating balance. The more you can attract wildlife, the more you have a healthy system. So within the garden, there is also lots of green manure. This is creeping comfrey. This is consoled uh, mina. Hmm? Consoled the mina. This is the minor? Yes. Small one. Yes. That's the margin? Uh, yes. And you just keep cutting these. Already, you see, in March they've got flowers, yes. which are edible. But mostly we use this to um, create fertility for the soil. Um, so we have plants growing up the wall here, um, plums, two different plums here. Um, this is cuttings lined out because we are propagating plants to sell. And then amazing flowers. I mean, look at these. Um, so you run this garden as a nursery also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We produce about five or six thousand plants a year here, which we sell. How many in the, uh, this nursery is operating from the beginning? No, no. Um, we just uh, started again here four or five years ago, haven't done it on another plant previously. Um, but uh, as you wander around, you can see all these things that are edible. So here we are. Um, mm. Oh, garlic. Wow, really good. Uh, mm. um, Lavenders here. More of these gooseberries I keep telling you about. This will also produce four kilos of wow. <laughs> And how old is this plant? Oh, I don't know, ten years or something. Ten years. Hmm. But uh, it's fairly easy to maintain. You just have to prune them once a year, pick the fruit. That's it. And because you've created fertility, and uh, that's what gives you all the food you need. Okay. Um, when we have waste, we now shred it and we put it, woody waste, and we put it in the pathways so you have something to walk on that helps drain the ground 
the beds when it rains heavily. This all waters the plants at the base and then next year we can dig this on top of the bed. Here's another one, this is very interesting. This is ruby sorrel. Ruby sorrel, yeah. Rubesque's Rumex sanguinea. Um, very pretty in a salad, it doesn't taste of an awful lot, but very edible. I prefer the garlic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here we've got some uh, um, perennial spinach, mm, leaf green spinach. Nice. Um, do you want to try some? Um, so that, here we are, again that's been growing all winter. And you can eat that as a salad or you can steam it. Yeah. Oh, um, very nice little yeah. um, Ferns at the back, which are just really um, for the wildlife. And um, tire towers. We use these to grow potatoes in, so we haven't planted yet this year. Um, We've got some more with horseradish in, mm -hmm. but we grow all our potatoes in towers so they don't um, take over the ground for other things. Mm 